What's going on YouTube and Brahman here? So today we are starting our Let's Talk series and we are starting with middle lane. Basically in this series I'm going to go over what you should be doing in ranked uh, to play mid lane effectively. So we will we have five categories here. Um, number one is the top five mid. So the one of the five mid laners you should be picking in game. Number two is the build on these mages or uh, mid laners rather. Number three is going to be your responsibilities early on. Number four is your mid to late game responsibilities slash uh, what you should be doing in team fights. And number five is how to play while you're ahead, while you have pressure, and how to play while you're behind or while the enemy is pressuring you. Okay, so we're just going to jump into number one here. Let's see. So number one on my list. So the first four mid laners that I'm going to go over are not necessarily in any order but the last mid laner is who i think is the best right now i think he's probably just regarded as the best character in the game in general so to start out we're going to start with the hunter actually uh so we will start with uller uh, i think uller is very strong um in ranked especially i think uller where uller falls off i think is in competitive play where people know how to play better against him um uller pops on very hard he has very strong clear uh with his one and his three. His one and his three make for really great follow-up damage in case your jungler gets a stun or a knock-up or anyone gets any type of CC. His one and his three alone do a ton of damage. Uh, in his uh, bow stance, that is. In his axe stance, he has a stun, which is insane. I think mid laners with stuns right now are so strong. Uh, if your mid laner and your jungler has a stun and they both hit it, there's really not much counterplay. You just get CC'd and you get killed. Uh, so I think that's really strong right now to have a stun in your kit while you're playing mid. Uh, not to mention his 2 gives him bonus power if he procs it in his bow stance, in his axe stance. Um, it gives him a mobility, it gives him movement speed that he needs to, to get in and out of team fights. Uh, his 3 also gives him more mobility with a jump. Um, I think he just makes for a great mid laner. He does not have that big mage burst, but he has CC. He has a ton of burst out of his one and his three. Um, and if you weave autos in between, it does just as much as mage damage. Um, there's a couple builds you can go with Ula, or a couple routes you can take. You can go into a later game auto attack build, which is very strong. Um, you can also just go into a more like a pen and power build, uh, which is also really strong. I think you can you can put cooldown into the build, and his abilities just do so much damage, especially. When you throw autos in between, he truly does one-shot carries late game. Uh, if you build him auto attack, he has great sustained damage. Uh, so this is why Uller is in the list. Okay, so next on the list, we are going to mages. Let's see, uh, Janus. I think Janus definitely deserves to be in this list. When Janus first came out, everyone thought he was a bad character. Uh, ever since he got played in the competitive scene and in ranked in general, this character has been regarded as one of the best in the game. Uh, one of the best characters in general. Uh, his one makes him extremely safe. His one makes portals. You can go in and out of walls. Uh, they aren't... They do not work on every single wall, but y you can make portals that give you pretty much mobility that other characters would never have or like, couldn't compare to. Uh, so his one makes him extremely safe. His two makes for really good clear. That's a lot of damage. Not a long cooldown. 10 seconds if you build cooldown with this character. Uh, like let's say you build 40% cooldown. His two is on 6 seconds. And you are shooting out uh, 360 plus 80% of your magical power. That is a ton of scaling. It is a ton of damage paired up with your passive. Uh, this two is on a very short cooldown and does massive damage in team fights and is extremely hard to avoid and goes extremely far. His three gives him uh, added mobility, will speed him up, slows your opponents down, so it's great in team fights. If you're winning the fight, you can place it on your opponents. Your opponents walk through and get slowed. You walk through and speed up. You can place it on your teammates. They also get sped up. Uh, this three, uh, Janus Threshold, is an extremely good mage ability. It, it makes for a, a lot of utility uh, in game. All right, so I believe Janus's best ability and one of the biggest reasons that people pick him is his ult. So through space and time, uh, you shoot a projectile that creates portals wherever its path is. I believe it goes. Uh, hmm. 
about half the map, so portals are made on about half of the map, regardless of where you shoot it through. Uh, so it does a ton of damage late game, will one-shot carries indefinitely. Um, it makes this character even safer. It makes for just about the greatest rotations in the game. There's only maybe one or two characters that have better rotations in a good position, maybe Thor. Uh, Chernobog is instantaneous. So uh, if those characters aren't in the game, Janus makes the best rotations, bar none. It is so hard to defend from his ganks. He can go to duo. He can go to solo and make power plays. Um, he can get your teammates out of a sticky situation by throwing them a portal or just throwing them through space and time, throwing them the ult to make several portals. You can just completely disengage. If you are in a team fight and the team fight is going poorly, maybe you lose someone, maybe someone gets picked and you have to rush out, you can throw space and time and get your entire team out into a better spot. Overall, the character is very strong. Um, he's got, I think he will be strong forever. Okay, next on this list is going to be Agni. Um, I like Agni a lot. Agni has come in and out of favor uh, recently. He seems really strong. A uh, ton of damage between his just his two and his ult alone do a ton of damage. He brings a lot of pressure early on. One of the best clears in the game as long as you stack up his passive. Um, the tick damage makes him great for uh, things like Divine Ruin. Um, if they have healers, cause the, it just lasts for such a long time. His three does massive damage, and if you can get away with it, it's some of the best clear in the game. A lot of people don't take it at level one because it is dangerous. If the, if the jungler rotates, you're as good as dead. Um, but the two is still really, really good. I think, uh, again, having a mid laner who also has a stun in his kit is so strong right now. You can practically just CC one person out in the 2v2 at mid jungle. Uh, in a mid jungle fight, you can just CC one target out if you and your jungler have a stun and just kill them before they can even react. Uh, so I think CC is valued very heavily right now. Uh, so if you don't know, Agni's ult is split up into three separate bombs. Um, each bomb late game does significant damage. 70% scaling uh, and 300 base damage makes your bombs doing an intense amount of damage. It, when you're sieging, you, you hardly even have to use any other abilities. You just can bomb stun uh, and really just do massive damage to the backline, which is what you're looking to do. Um, I like this god a lot. He's been around for a long time. I think he'll come in and out of favor a lot. Uh, there's a lot of good mages in the game. I think the worst part about him is the fact that he does not have CC immunity. Um, but I think he makes up for it with his pressure and his team fight potential. Okay, so the fourth god on this list is going to be Thoth. I don't think this will come as a surprise to people. The really only downside of Thoth is level, I don't know, let's say one and two, maybe. His clear at level one isn't the greatest because of the fact that it is separated into three shots or three, um, three projectiles, whereas your opponent's clear is likely just one, so they can use it and then auto the wave. They'll be autoing the wave faster. But Thoth is not outmatched um, distance wise he can poke further than anyone in the game you can get off damage with Thoth and they cannot respond to you uh, I think that is probably the strongest part about this character his one does massive damage late game his two is the longest dash in the game making him an extremely safe character not to mention the fact that his after his dash you get a projectile that stuns the target so if anyone does happen to chase you all the way through that long dash, you can stun them off and keep walking. Late game, if you build cooldown, this is only on a 20, 12 seconds base. Uh, it goes down very low. It goes down to roughly like eight or you know like eight to ten seconds. So it's a it's a very short cooldown for a dash, the furthest dash in the game. Makes it just makes for a really safe character, um, and not to mention the dash does a load of damage late game. Uh, so three is also really great. It's probably, I wouldn't say undervalued, but it is extremely strong for securing objectives. It augments all of his abilities to be extremely long range. Um, it augments your auto attacks, your hunter's auto attacks, so you can get objectives really fast with this character um, in a hunter. Uh, I, I just think it's probably one of the best utility things that a mage has in the game right now, if not the best. His ult. I think Thoth's ult is really similar to Ra ult. I just honestly think it's better. 
Uh, it does have a wind-up time, whereas Ra has like a pseudo wind-up time because you have no choice but to stand still. Thoth ult, you do not have to stand still. Uh, you can wind it up as you go. Um, it is. It doesn't take a little bit longer than Ra ult to actually hit, but it is just as long range. It will indefinitely one-shot carries late game with 100% magical power. Uh, I think it is one of the strongest mage ults in the game right now. All right, last on this list is going to be a hunter. Uh, I, this character, I believe, is the best god in the game right now. Chernabug uh, is so strong in mid. I believe he's better in mid than he is in duo uh, because of the simple fact that you can use your ult to make rotations to duo and to solo and hardly miss anything. You can go to mid, you can clear your wave, back to base, gank with your ult, make a power play with your jungler, and then get back to mid maybe when it reaches the tower um i think he's bonkers if you don't know what his ult does uh once you ult you go up into the sky slows the entire enemy team gives you damage mitigations i believe it is 30 percent at max level um and then you come down so which means no one can fight you there's not a single character in the game that can fight you late game with 30 percent mitigations so if you are careful using this ult you are unfightable uh slowing the entire enemy team and being getting to the fight instantaneously besides that i think turner bug brings a lot of pressure in mid uh he has really good clear with his one it does initial damage and that does detonate damage if you wait long enough or if you shoot the two through it the two also does a lot of damage it is a projectile uh the three is an aoe ability i mean the one rather is an aoe ability and the two is a projectile if you shoot it right through the one it also roots any targets inside and uh, detonates the one. Extremely strong. This two also gives him a steroid 60% late game, which is unbelievable. 60% uh, on a relatively short cooldown, 12 seconds. Uh, it blows my mind. This character seems to me to be overtuned, uh, and this the attack speed steroid also lasts for five seconds. Uh, the three, another ability where I think it's probably the best of its kind. Um, the dash. I think this is the best dash in the game. You can dash uh, into a wall and have complete immunity from everything around you. So if there's a Neath ult coming at you, the Neath ult will just vanish after it hits. It will just hit nothing. Um, if there's a tower shot, it will also go away. Any ability that's on you, if John Quake ghosts are chasing you and you dash into the wall, the ghost will no longer exist. Uh, on you at least, they will miss you. I think this dash is just the best. Take, being able to just take yourself off the map, um, and the fact that he can take himself off the map with his three and his ult makes him so safe. It's so hard to engage on this character because you can three away, you can ult out, uh, and then you can three again, um, which makes for a lot of time for your team to get to you. Um, and then once you get out of the ult, you're just unfightable. You can come, you can just drop down on the enemy team and start fighting. 30% mitigations is it's just a, an absurd amount to give to a carry. Um, all right, so that's everyone on my top five. I have a few honorable mentions. So first is going to be Baron. Uh, Baron is not on this list. He would be number one by far, uh, but I think Baron is getting nerfed and. Uh, I do think Baron builds into tank items better. I think for a while he just was the best character in the game because he was way over tuned. But I do think he builds tankier better, so I think we see him in uh, support and solo, and I think that's where he should be. Uh, number two is Morrigan. Morrigan is not on this list because I think Morrigan is a player that gets played at a competitive level very, very high and is much harder to play if you are not that great of a player. Uh... I do think the people who can play Morgan well frustrate me a lot. Uh, they are probably very good. I don't like this character because of the stealth aspect, but another reason why she's not on the main list is because I think she's probably better played in a tank position. Um, oddly enough, she can be played on any position in ranked uh, support, ADC, jungle, mid, and solo. You can pick this god anywhere. It sounds weird, but it is true because of the simple fact that you can turn into anyone. You can be anyone whenever you need to be. Um, if they pick a really overpowered character, you can pick Morgan, transform into that character into team fights. Um, it sort of evens the playing field. I've seen a lot of people doing this lately. It is a good pick, but I think she builds better into tanky items so that she is allowed to be disruptive and in your face without just getting picked. 
Okay, third in this list is going to be Jean Quay. Uh, Jean Quay is another one of those characters who I believe builds better into tankiness. So I believe he's a solo laner, but I do think he is good in mid, uh, namely be because of the fact that uh, it's really hard to engage on him. He's extremely tanky. He has a heal um, built into his kit. It is a heal, and it does burst damage, a lot of burst damage if you detonate it fast. Um, and he has just so many protections, so he's great for disengaging, great for anti-sieging, but I do think he builds better into tanky items. Uh, okay, so last on the honorable mention list is going to be Scylla. Uh, for the simple fact that Scylla is bad early. Uh, and when I say bad, I mean bad. She has poor clear, very poor pressure. She doesn't do that much damage. Um, and that's really it. Late game Scylla, I believe, is one of the strongest mages. Um, if she catches you with a 1-2 combo, you're pretty much just dead. She can shred tanks. Um, but unfortunately, she takes a little bit too long to get online. And right now, pressure is important in this meta. So for part two of the Let's Talk, I'm going to go over how to build with these gods respectively. So I'm going to start with Uller uh, and Chernabog because I feel like their builds differ much more than the other mid laners because of the fact that they are hunters. So with Uller starting in mid, let's just go to the god builder here. You are going to want to start with Transcendence 2. You want three health pots. Three health pots, and you want two mana pots. With Uller, you're burning a lot of mana, and you need the health pots for the sustain, especially if you're going to trade in mid. Um, I think multi pots are good on this god, but he does burn through mana fast. Uh, I don't think Mage's Blessing is worth getting. The faster you get into this transcendence, the faster you start doing serious damage and start bullying in the lane. Okay, now you want, I think, after you get your transcendence, so we're going to put transcendence in here. After you get your transcendence, you're going to want to go into power boots. Early on, you want the power. I don't think you want the attack speed on this god. Now, the third slot is definitely up for contention. I have seen... There's so much you can do on this god, but what I think is the strongest right now is going Crusher. Crusher gives you power, attack speed, and penetration. Every stat that is good on this character, the added uh, damage that you get from your physical power is just a bonus, really, with this item. I mean, all of these stats are exactly what you need. Okay, so fourth... I mean, like I said, I've seen a lot of stuff here. I think you can either go, uh, if you want to start moving towards a later game build, you can go Executioner, followed by a Kin Size, and then you can end with a Titan's Bane. Like I said, if you want to go more towards an auto attack base build, this build does a ton of ability damage, a ton of auto attack damage. The only thing that you are missing out on here is any type of sustain so you don't have any life steal so um, i think this is why this second route is what i would prefer and i think what a lot of what most people prefer on this god you go the blood forge after the blood forge you're gonna want to go you can either go another pen item so you can go near full pen on this god so you can go Jotun's, it gives you cooldown, it gives you more ability power, more penetration, or you can go a Brawler's. Now this is if you want to go and then you're going to end with your Titan's Bane um, so that you will be able to smack the tanks late game. This is a full power build with almost full cooldown. This allows you to spam your abilities quickly. Um, your auto attacks will do a ton of damage. Let's see, where's the in-hand damage stat? Uh, basic attack damage. Oh, I don't have my abilities or my items. All right, so this is going to give you 358 in hand damage between using your ability, you, comboing your abilities, and weaving auto attacks in between. You're going to do so much damage with this build. Um, like I said, the later game auto attack base build is also good, it will give you more sustained damage. Um, 
it might be better DPS overall, but using this build, you will be able to just about blow up any carry in the game with one rotation of your abilities. Okay, so let's move on to Chernabog here. Chernabog. We'll go to the God Builder on Chernabog. So, on Chernabog, in mid, it is no different than when you are playing ADC. So you're going to want to start your Hunter's Blessing. You want... I prefer Dev Gloves on this character. Reason being, his late game is absurd with his steroid. I think he does really well building into Devs. Regardless of um, the character, late game, Dev Gauntlet in an auto attack build is always going to be stronger than an ability based build on a Hunter. That is just how the math works out in Smite. Um, and it makes sense to me. Hunters are supposed to be the most powerful late game character. So we are going to go... Um, for the attack speed on this character, I prefer to go the uh, attack speed boots, Ninja Tabai. Um, it depends on how much pressure you're getting in mid. If you're getting a lot of pressure, you want to go boots first to have your mobility. So let's assume that we are getting boots first for the mobility. You're going to then want to go into your dev gloves. Third, this is where the build kind of differentiates. You can pick between... So you can go into Poison Star, and then you want to go your Executioner. Um, I think we can just did a video on Hunter builds. So, like he said, Poison Star and Executioner are interchangeable. You can go either of them in those slots. Um, and then you want to go Wind Demon, and then you want to end with a Deathbringer. This is going to give you a ton of crit damage. There's a little bit of RNG involved, but you will to three four probably more likely four shot carries you will kill them faster than they can kill you you'll blow mages up you'll blow other hunters up this is by far the best boxing build this build does lack pen because you're only getting pen by way of executioner so against tanks is going to take quite a long time to lock them down uh, and as a hunter in a fight you can't just be sitting there autoing you will get collapsed on if they play it properly so this is risky against tanks if you are winning the game and you're kind of snowballing this is a really strong build it is definitely the best boxing build it will by far beat the pen build so the other build you can go on this character is instead of going poison star here you can go straight into itchable if you're going to go this build i would recommend going the warrior tabai itchable is going to give you so much attack speed uh, and then you're going to go into executioner Let's get rid of these quick. Right into Kinsai and Titan's Bane. There is no RNG involved with this build. You will know exactly how much your auto attacks are doing late game, and they still do a ton. Instead of four, instead of three or four auto attacks killing a carry, it might take you, uh, you know, five or six. But you are shooting auto attacks out extremely fast. You will be hitting tanks extremely hard. It is going to be so tough for them to zone you. Late game, this is superior against tanks and inferior against carries. This is the inferior boxing build, so do not look to trade characters that have crit. But this is the build for Chernabog if you're going to go mid. Some people go Transcendence into some type of uh, hybrid power auto attack build. I do not like Transcendence. I really do think devs. I know for a fact devs is a better item late game, and I really think it's the way to go on Chernabog. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the mages. So we're going to start with, right, this is going to be tough because mage builds vary, are varying a ton right now, especially between competitive and ranked, uh, lower level ranked, higher level ranked. So we're just going to go with Agni because I think Agni has the most variations in build right now. Okay, so I've seen a ton of starts. Um, not that, obviously, definitely not that. Uh, what I think are the viable starts is this. So I have seen... Bancroft 2 start. This gives you, let's see, it gives you 60 power, 100 mana, 8% lifesteal, a ton of power to clear the wave. Um, you can finish this off with, you can go straight into Bancroft. This gives you amazing fighting potential early on, 100 power. It gives you lifesteal, so you get to sustain while you're doing damage. This is by far the best build for your first item. Like, if you're looking to fight early, this is the best. After the Bancroft's Talon. Um, again, this is another thing that changes. Is just changes depending on 
the player so here you can get purple boots or you can get blue boots i think the cooldown on the man is really nice but since we have bancroft and we're life stealing off our abilities i think you want to get their purple boots here um reason being the more damage you do the more you're going to heal i just think it's more efficient here uh, it does a ton of damage now after this again there's a ton of variations i like to go spear a ton of damage it gives you cooldown um, it'll reset your cooldowns if you kill a god or reset your cooldowns by one second if you kill a god after this you probably want to go some type of pen i believe spear of the magus in my opinion is the best on agni he's got a lot of tick damage from his passive he has tick damage in his uh dash his three uh, besides that he just has a lot of abilities in his kit that are gonna do damage now Let's move on to the last few items. Now, these items are going to completely depend on if the other team has healers, if they're more tanky. So if they have any type of healing, like if you think their sustain is getting out of hand, you can replace Spear of Desolation with Divine Ruin. Or if you can deal with the healing early on, get divine ruin later on but if you if it's impacting fights and you can tell that there's some type of issue with healing get divine ruin early on it will help your entire team it will pretty much make it so their abilities are half as effective or i i think this does 40 percent yeah this does 40 percent reduced healing such a good item great stats penetration on mages is such a good stat um and right now what i've been seeing a lot of you can go uh you could go so soul gem is an option on Agni, it gives you cooldown, it gives you health, it gives you more life steal. I think it's it's a really strong item. Heals your teammates every five abilities. You can go Soul Reaver. You have a lot of abilities in um, Agni's kit. Although late game, you're primarily going to be doing damage and you know helping sieges and securing things with your bombs. So Soul Reaver may not be the correct choice if you are going to build the Bancrofts. And you have what was the other item I was thinking of? Where is it? Um, let's see. And you have Book of the Dead. Book of the Dead, I think, is really strong. Even if you don't build into mana items, I think having the health shield uh, is really good for defensive purposes. Um, if you dash in as Agni and they try to pick you, uh, you get the health shield. You can possibly be peeled out by your team. I just think it's a really good defensive item right now. The last item that I will point out is Rod of Tahuti. Rod of Tahuti gives an immense amount of power. 150 flat power from an item is the highest for a magical item in the game right now. Um, also, the passive is really strong. Basic attacks and abilities gain 20% additional magical power against targets below 50% health. So you start doing a lot more damage when they fall under 50%. This is really, really, really strong for anti-sieging. You can bait the, uh, the frontliners of the opposing team into tanking the Phoenix, CC them under the Phoenix, and then expend all of your abilities when they're under 50% and you do 20% or 25% more damage. Uh, I think it is a really strong last item. So we're going to pick this for our last item, let's say, in this build. Um, overall, this, this build has good sustain, where Agni lacks. He obviously has no sustain. Really strong early game with Bancroft's Talon. Finishing Bancroft makes you pretty much unfightable as long as you play it correctly. A little bit of cooldown coming out from your Spear of Desolation, plus Pen, uh, plus a really strong passive. Spear of the Magus is for Pen. Divine Ruin, if they have healing. Let's say they don't have healing here. Um, I am going to say you can either go a soul gem or you can go, um, hmm, let's say soul gem or book of the dead or soul reaver. All of these items are really strong. They all do a ton of damage. Book of the dead is more defensive where soul reaver is more offensive gives you two percent added damage on all of your abilities which can be good but with not much cooldown on your build i think it is better on other gods okay so moving on from agni we are going to go to let's see agni into thoth okay so thoth it's going to be similar now, I was going to go back to Agni, but we can just do this on Thoth. I think right now, which is a build that I've been seeing, um, which is pretty common, you start out with Book of Thoth Tier 2. 
So you can also do this on Agni in the same exact build, and it will be very strong. So you have 65 power, 125 mana. This will give you really good clear. The only thing that this lacks is um, the life steal that the Bancrofts gives you, which is really nice. This build will be inferior to the Bancrofts when you have both of them at the start. Um, this is because you have sustain coming out of the Bancrofts. You have an item that is not, this is a stacking item, so Book of Thoth you have to stack up to get the full benefit out of, whereas Bancrofts you just get that flat 100 power, plus the life steal, plus the passive of when you're lower you get stronger or more powerful. So Book of Thoth at the start is going to be weaker. Before you finish your Book of Thoth, you should certainly be going boots here. Uh, let's see. Nope. Alright, so on Thoth, I like power boots on Thoth. I really don't think you need more than one rotation of abilities to kill anyone usually ever. Uh, I don't think the blue boots help you out early on. I like the damage you get out of the penetration. It helps you with clear. It helps you with poking. It. I just think they're more useful on Thoth right now. I don't think you need more than one rotation is really all it comes down to uh, with this character. Okay, so third item... Again, there's a ton of variations you can go here. Uh, what I like to do is go Soul Gem. This item gives you, again, you have it gives you a little bit less power than you could be getting from other items, from alternatives. It gives you health. Now you have lifesteal. It gives you cooldown and a nice passive that'll heal you in case you're fighting. Right here, I like to go Pen. I have seen people building Spear. I don't know if I agree with Spear, only because of the fact that late game, when you are ulting, you want to be ulting for as much immediate damage as possible, and if you don't apply your Spear of the Magus, um, your ult's going to do more damage with Obsidian Shard. So I think for the late game purposes, I think Obsidian Shard is better. Um, I really do believe this. If you do, if you disagree, let me know. Um, so for, for your fifth item here, we are going to go with, like, there's a ton of different things you can do again. Um, I think I like Book of the Dead most here. Book of the Dead pairs up with Book of Thoth really well because of the fact that Book of Thoth gives you a health shield based on a percentage of your mana. So between Book of Thoth and Book of the Dead giving you mana, you have a ton of mana. Your health shield, I believe with this build, I think the last time I tested it, I think this gives you about half of your health or as a shield or 40% of your health as a shield it seems absolutely absurd to me and I can't imagine a mage versus mage matchup in duel where it's like bulwark and book of the dead that seems crazy to me but anyway I think book of the dead is really great here in in those scenarios where you do get caught out as thought which is rare but it's still important to have this item okay so for your last item um I'd like to go I think Rod of Tehuti, again, is such a strong item on Thoth. Be reason being, after you ult, um, or in any type of team fights, your one has three charges. So, typically, you're not going to just one-shot someone with the first, or the first two. Typically, they'll be around, you know, maybe whatever they're around. Typically, by the third charge, they're around under half of their health. So, by the third shot of your one... You should be doing bonus damage. You'll be doing 25% more bonus damage. If you decide to dash in because they're low, you'll be doing more damage. This item just gives a ton of magical power. Uh, between this and Book of Thoth, you'll obviously never be out of mana. You, you won't have to worry about mana at all. Um, there are other things you can do here. I think you can go... I think Soul Reaver is just fine in this slot. Let's see. Soul Reaver. It's really whatever you're comfortable with and whatever your play style is like. Uh, you can tinker around with this. I also think Kronos Pendant is a decent item on Thoth. Uh, the cooldown reduction is really strong. You can start popping off with your ult. You can start if you're ahead. If you're if you are team is in the lead, I think Chronos Pendant is strong to keep getting rotations of your abilities off. If you're if you're being the one that's influencing fights the most, I think you I think cooldown is more important than anything else. So uh, I think that is the build for Thoth. And like I said, if you want to go Chronos Pendant, you have the option of going Chronos Pendant. You can get rid of this Soul Gem to get more cooldown. I mean, I think it's really good if you're in control and you're the one that is pretty much carrying the game for your team okay so moving on from thoth that build can also be applied to agni as well by the way so moving on from thoth we have i believe it is the last mid yeah janice okay so janice's build is going to be really similar here but again we're going to be starting out with that book of thoth 
tier two book of the um, and I believe when you do this build you have enough for two health pots and a mana pot so you're gonna start with book of thoth or actually you're gonna finish your boots here uh, I like to go purple boots I think purple boots are so strong on this character uh, and then you'll finish book of thoth second third is gonna be the chronos pendant by this point in time you're gonna want to be ulting and influencing the game as much as you can everyone knows Janus rotates faster than anyone in the game uh, Aside from possibly a well-positioned Thor, but it is super hard to counter gank a Janus because he rotates so fast. Uh, he's really efficient with farming. So I think having more cooldown and being able to gank and being able to influence the game as this character is really important. Um, after Kronos Pendant, you, I think you go Obsidian Shard here. This is what I would go. Um, I, there was a time when people were going Spear, but I believe it was only because Obsidian Shard got nerfed and Spear of the Magus was better. Um, right here, again, there's a lot of different things you can go. I think cooldown is extremely important, so this slot could be Soul Gem. Um, the cooldown is good. Again, the Soul Gem passive is really strong. I think you can go Spear of Desolation. Reason being is because Janus typically picks up a lot of kills in a fight. And to pick up kills, sometimes you have to portal in. If you portal in, pick up a kill, this will reduce your cooldowns by a second. Hopefully, you can juke a little bit and then get yourself a portal out. I think it is a really strong item for that reason. Um, or or if you have to ult in there's just so many things you can do with this item and I think cooldown is one of Janice's uh, biggest boons while playing him uh, and so for the last item again it's so tough to pick a last item in this meta uh, soul reaper is strong although I think Janice has less abilities um, le like less abilities in his rotation than the average mages so I don't think um, old soul reaper would be good here but that clearly doesn't exist if they have healing i think you're gonna go divine ruin if they have healing you want to put this divine ruin where the spear of desolation is if they don't have healing i really do think rod of hoodie rod of tahuti is extremely strong like i said um you can bait bait sieges counter siege uh shoot ults from across the map it just the item is really strong gives a ton of power right now and i think helps mages out late game an immense amount for the rest of the video i have one clip of where you should start in mid short clip and a diagram of where you should ward in mid early but for the rest of the video i will just be showing random gameplay this is not to give examples uh just something to watch while you listen okay so for the third part of this video we're going to go over the responsibilities of the mid laner in the early game first and foremost you will be starting at the speed buff with the jungler after you help him clear his speed buff you will be going directly to mid lane and clearing your wave you have pressure in mid, you're going to want to go to your red, unless you have so much pressure you can invade their red, but this is a dangerous play if you don't know where the jungler is, so I would suggest you going straight to your red buff. After you clear your red buff, you can go back to mid. This is where you should be meeting up with your jungler. If he's on mid camps, help him clear mid camps, and then go back to the wave. For the rest of the game, this is going to be a recurring scenario. You are in charge of clearing your mid wave. So if jungler comes, don't expect him to use all his abilities to clear the midwave. That is your responsibility. You are responsible as well for helping him clear mid camps and securing mid camps and securing any camps that the opponent is going for on your side of the jungle. If you so choose to invade them because you have a lead, it is also your responsibility to secure these camps. Um, you will typically have more burst damage than your jungler. That's just how it happens. or It's usually just how uh, mid laners are designed or mages. Um, let's see. The most important thing that I feel that you are responsible for in mid is warding up these certain areas. So the mini map above with the highlighted areas shows you where the most important points to ward for mid is. As a mid laner, you see a lot of traffic in mid. So you're going to see people going into the jungle towards duo side. You will see people going to the jungle towards solo side. It is your responsibility or your jungler, whoever sees them, to let your team know where everyone is going. If you see the jungler cross over in mid, let the duo side know. If he's going to that side of the jungle, they potentially have a gank coming. If you see the jungler going into the solo side of the map, let the solo laner know, back off, and don't fight. You potentially have a gank coming. If you let your teammates know where everyone's going and your teammate have, teammates have a good idea of where everyone is on the map, you will be much safer and they won't take bad fights. Now, so these five places that you should ward early, 
you can obviously not do it by yourself. If you don't know this, you can only have two wards on you at any, or two wards on the map at any given time. Technically, you can have three because you can have two regular wards and a sentry in your inventory. So, the two lower wards are defensive wards. The two wards that are closer to your side of the jungle. They'll let you know if someone is trying to gank you on your side of the jungle. Um, they'll let you know if anyone goes into your jungle, you'll be able to see them. The two higher wards are more aggressive wards. They allow for your jungler to make ganks to let them know if anyone's coming. Um, to let you know where they're coming out of their jungle or where they're going into their jungle. And I think the ward in mid is my favorite by far. So this ward that is directly in the middle of mid lane, you will see any traffic going across the lane. You will see the mid laner in the mid lane. Uh, so if the jungler is trying to gank, he knows exactly where he is. If he's uh, has you know projectile abilities, any type of skill shots that he needs to hit, he can blink the wall. He'll know exactly where the mid laner is, where to expect him. Um, I think this is a really strong board because when you're not in mid, when you can't call enemy missing calls, the opponent will know uh, if anyone crosses over. It'll be caught on the ward. So as long as your duo lane and your solo lane is paying enough attention, they should know where uh, your opponents are crossing over on the map at least. If they don't, you can still use this ward to let them know. So if you see something and you don't think they're going to recognize it, let's say you say the jungler cross over mid, go to duo side, and you don't think they see it, they're fighting, you can just say enemy missing middle, be careful right, or be careful left, wherever it so happens to be. And the last thing that is important for your responsibilities early on is rotations. If you see your mid laner rotating over to duo to gank with the jungler, you need to make sure that you're rotating in behind him. Make sure that when you rotate, you rotate safely so they can't just turn around right on you. So rotate through your jungle. Um, if they go through your jungle, you have to go lower than them. So when they gank, you can immediately counter gank. If you see your mid laner going to gank any lane, you need to be following him. You can't just let him rotate freely and get kills and, and get, make other lanes get behind. So for the fourth part of this video, we're going to be going over the mid to late game responsibilities that the mid laner has. Uh, I think the most important thing to talk about first would be team fighting. Uh, a lot of team fighting is completely based on how you use your abilities and how you position yourself. As the mid laner, you should be positioned um, in the back of your team. You should be pretty much grouped with your ADC so that whenever anyone in tries to initiate, you guys are furthest in the back, you are the toughest to get to, and your frontliner should be in front of you. Now, I think it's really important to collaborate with your ADC late game, especially if you are a mid laner that has CC, and you have an ADC that has CC. If you have someone like a tank trying to zone you, you guys can both lock him down, and you can burst through him. With all the penetration you should have late game, um, you and your ADC together should be able to burn through tanks. Another important thing to know for team fights is as a mage or mid laner rather you should be poking with abilities and be getting yourself into a safe spot. The idea is that you want to be able to hit your opponents with their abilities and they don't want to hit you. Mages are typically long range characters so you should be able to get free damage off in team fights if you do get initiated on use your escape use your mobility to get out and don't engage in that fight until you have your escape up again. Um, if you happen to turn around and re-engage when you don't have your escape, it is likely that the assassin will jump on you, you'll get CC'd by the guardian or the warrior, and that will be the end of you. Um, you are very squishy as a mage, so you have to be extremely careful about how you engage and when you engage. So this should go without being said, but I think it's important to note that as the mid laner, you still have the responsibility of warding. Late game, I think warding is almost more important than early game as long as your team has awareness early game uh, you should know where everyone is or have a good idea of where everyone is on the map at lower elos obviously this isn't true but late game you want to be warding those choke points around the gold fury warding the choke points around the fire giant the fire giant pit is very small and there's a lot of areas around there that people can be very sneaky um, you have behind the fire giant the two wards in mid that you can get at the choke points so late game, you still need to keep warding, keep getting sentries. Sentries are really important. Um, if you don't have sentries, they're obviously just going to take your wards away. Uh, more importantly, you need to be grouping with your team to get these wards off the map. If you place a sentry down, you need to be with your team to get it because whoever places the sentry could just get CC'd and it could be taken by the opponent. Lastly, uh, and one of the most important things, at least at a higher level of ELO, is making sure that you secure, secure objectives in team fights. So if your team is going for the Gold Fury, or if your team is going for the Fire Giant, certain gods like Isis, you'll see you'll see um, individuals put their ult down, let the ult charge up, and they'll either combo with their two, 
or they'll just pop it when it's at max when the gold fury or the fire giant is about to die and as the mage you should have the most burst in order for your team to secure the fire giant or the gold fury another important thing to note while playing uh, mid is during a siege or during an anti-siege your job is going to be to stay in the back if you have cc you're going to help your adc and cc anyone that tries to engage on the both of you you will be doing burst damage still from far away but now you can stand uh, next to walls and you can throw abilities over walls to points where they can't your opponents cannot hit you um, it's really important to use these walls to your advantage especially when you're anti-sieging um, you can make sure that you put a, a ward over the wall, and if they don't sentry it, you'll have vision of the entire team, so you can freely throw out abilities. This makes it really tough when it comes time to them actually sieging, and their teammates are already low or have a chunk of health taken out of them because you're throwing your abilities over the wall. All right, so the last topic we're going to be talking about is how to play mid with a lead and how to play mid while you're behind. Um, I'm going to go over mainly the early game and how to avoid getting snowballed or how to snowball so it's important especially while you're ahead to ward you need to be warding um, offensively if you are behind you need to be warding defensively so that means your jungle that is closest to you this will um, allow you to avoid ganks um, if they are pressuring your buff so if they're ahead they have pressure and they're pressuring your buffs throw a ward in the buff so you know when it spawns and when it spawns you need to be at it at the exact same time now if you see that they're invading your jungle let's say the mid and jungler is invading your red you can ask the duo lane to come over so now it is a 4v2 and you should win that fight 10 times out of 10 i don't care if you're two levels down i don't care if you're three levels down you should be winning that fight so the most important thing to do when you're behind is collaborate with your team and try to catch your opponent off guard in a scenario where they think they can take the fight and you have a man up or a two man up advantage whether this is at camps or whether this is um, at bigger objectives, you need to make sure that you're playing towards or playing with an advantage rather. So now if you're ahead, uh, you should be warding aggressively so that you can see the top side of the map, um, the two choke points that are closer to their jungle. You should be looking to invade buffs. If you recognize the fact that duo lane has backed and red buff has spawned, you and your jungler should be invading that red, getting it as fast as possible and getting out. Now another thing you can do is look to just pressure them in their jungle or you can pressure them at mid camps as well you can just look to fight them um, if you happen to you know kill the mid laner or kill the jungler get his or her beads uh, you can just keep looking to pressure that one character just combo them out over and over and over again more importantly when you are ahead in mid you want to be influencing your side lanes so if you are ahead in mid let's say you push them out you should be going to gank duo um, you should be going to gank solo the faster you get your entire team ahead the faster you will win the game now you want to be doing this efficiently you don't want to leave a wave in mid go gank duo and then you know have a failed gank you want to be clearing your wave hustling over to a lane if you're going to gank or if you're a character like janice clearing your wave ulting over if you're a character like chernabog exact same thing chernabog is probably the most efficient uh when he's ahead in, in being able to just gank whenever he wants he can kind of just do whatever he wants right now um, but anyway, it is really important as any role really, but mid lane especially, to influence your side lanes. If you think I missed anything or if you think I'm wrong about anything, please leave it in the comments below. If you're new to the channel, consider subscribing. Thanks for watching guys. See you next time.